Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18. Where are we going to? Revelation chapter 18. Last Sabbath, we began a series which is akin to present truth, and that series is the final warning. And this past Thursday evening, we touched on that briefly in that study in the book Great Controversy, the final warning. And this warning, we find, is also called the loud cry, the strong voice, the mighty cry of the three angels' messages, the loud cry of the third angel. Look with me. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. Are we there, my friends? Father in heaven, today we desire fresh bread from heaven's bakery. We thank you for what you will do in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. The Bible brings to view earth's final warning. Amen. Now, hold your place in chapter 18. Go with me. Chapter 14. Chapter 14 of the Revelation. And what you want to note is that chapter 14 of the Revelation, it brings to view the final warning to the world. And this can be confirmed by looking at verse number 6 through verse number 16. And what do we find in these verses? We find the second coming of Jesus Christ to gather in the harvest of souls. Is that clear, my friends? Go now to chapter 18 of Revelation. In chapter 18 of Revelation, the whole chapter shows us the final warning to the world. But specifically, verse number 4 and verse number 23. Verse number 4 tells us the plagues will be poured out. The seven last plagues. Is that point clear? And verse number 23 tells us that one day very, very soon, the voice of the bridegroom will cease. Who is that bridegroom, by the way? It's Christ. And that call to salvation will one day cease. Now notice with me verse number 1 of chapter 18 of the Revelation. Verse number 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, This is a loud cry, the strong cry, the strong voice. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Note this, earth's final warning, it's a repetition of the second angel's message. Verse 2, He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen is fallen and is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Skip on down. Verse number three, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. On your note paper, you should have written down the final warning of chapter 18 of Revelation. It's a repetition of which angel's message? Talk to me. Which one? The second. Put beside that statement, Great Controversy, page 600. And three, paragraph two. This also confirms it. Not only a repetition, but it shows us how Babylon has gotten worse. The corruption has progressed, not upward, but downward. And the Bible now tells us that Babylon is falling, is falling. In the primary sense, who is Babylon? Talk to me. It's the papacy, chapter 17. Look at that quickly. Chapter 17 of the Revelation. The papacy in the primary sense is Babylon. This woman, apostate woman. It's also apostate Protestants, especially in America. That is found in verse 3 through verse number 6. Put that down on your note paper. We're studying today. And look at this. Put this quotation down beside that point. Great Controversy, 
page 382. Paragraph 2 and paragraph number 3. It's the papacy, Babylon, apostate Protestants, Babylon, primary and secondary sins. Look with me now. Verse number 5. The Bible tells us, and upon her forehead, chapter 17, verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, what, my friends? Mystery. Babylon the great, the whom? The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So what is on her forehead? What title does she carry? The mother of harlots. And verse number six, is this power a persecuting power? Does she kill the saints of God? Now look at this right here, my friends. Which church today claims to be the mother church? Who claims to be the mother church? Jesus says, I tell you these things before they come to pass. That when they come to pass, you might believe. John 14, 29. Here it is, my friends. The Vatican, BBC News, declares a certain statement that has provoked the Protestant churches. Blue words at the bottom. John Paul, the Pope, said what? The Roman Catholic Church is the what, my friends? Is the mother of all Christian denominations. Is that the fulfillment of prophecy? And that it is incorrect to refer to the Church of England and other Protestant churches as uh, sister organizations on a par with Rome. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Notice now, go back with me to chapter 18 of the Revelation. Earth's final warning is not only a repetition of the second angel's message, but it is a repetition of the third angel's message. Is that point clear? Look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of what two things? That you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive what? Not of her plagues. All right. This is a repetition of the third angel's message. Let's confirm that. Go to chapter 14. Chapter 14, the revelation. In verse number 9, we find the third angel's message. Amen, my friends. And verse number 9 says, if any man does what? Worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. In his forehead, on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the what? The wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? It's the seven last plagues. What text say that, my friends? Revelation chapter 15. And verse number one. So this is a repetition of the third angel's message. If that point is clear, my friends, say amen. amen. So now notice. Does anyone know when the first angel's message began to be preached, especially in America? What year? Does anybody know? Who knows? 1833. What year, my friends? Hold your place in chapter 18 of the Revelation. Go to chapter 14. What says that first angel in verse 6 and verse 7? Saying with a loud voice, what? Fear God. And give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. When did that judgment hour message begin to be preached in the United States of America? When specifically? What year? All right. 1833. Write down these references from Great Controversy. 1833. All right. Page 332. 333 and 351 of the Great Controversy. It's on your sermon notes. Put it down. Also, Great Controversy, page 368 by William Miller and the Millerites. Just as Americans, you must understand your history as a Christian denomination, as Seventh-day Adventists, must we understand our history? Should we? All right. Look with me now. Look at the chart, my friends. This chart shows us, far left on the chart, you find the first angel's message. And there are your references. And when did that message begin to be preached 
in America by William Miller and the Millerites. What year, my friends? 1833 A.D. Look with me. Chapter 14 now. Look at verse 8. Verse number 8 mentions the second angel's message. When was that proclaimed in America? Open chart test. Open book test. It's right there. When, my friends? In the summer of 1844. Your reference is right there. Great controversy. The second from your left. Great controversy. Page 389, paragraph 2. It says, uh, first sentence, it says, uh, The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in what year? In the summer of 1844. We know that. Does anyone know when the third angel's message began to be preached in America? Who knows? When? I'm so glad the chart is not there. Look now, chapter 14, Revelation. Look at verse number 9. Now put this on your paper. The third angel's message, we must study, my friends. The third angel's message has two parts to it. How many parts? Come on, talk to me. How many parts? Two parts. The first part is found in chapter 14 of Revelation, verse 9 and verse 10. That's the first part. Put it down. The first part Chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 9 and verse 10, which says what? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Amen. The second part of the third angel's message is found in verse number 12. What verse? Verse 12, which says what? Let's read that. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus, so again, how many parts comprise the third angel's message? How many parts? Two. All right. Understand this. The, the understanding of the second part came first. Did you get that? You said yes. What did I just say a while ago? The understanding of the second part came first. Let's make sure you're with me. What is the second part of the third angel's message? Chapter 14 and verse 12 of the Revelation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will give us peace in this place. As we study your words, let not one word fall unheeded. This is ultimately too important to miss these points. We need your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. How many parts? Two, Two parts. All right, put down. The second part came when? First. The understanding of the second part came first. Why? Because our pioneers understood the commandments were still binding. The seven-day Sabbath is still binding before they understood the mark of the beast crisis. What did I just say a while ago? They understood the commandments of God were still binding. The Sabbath is binding upon God's people. Amen. Before they understood the beast the image and the mark of the beast. Does that make sense to you, my friends? Amen. All right, watch now. Let's confirm that. Let's check our answers. What's on the screen? The third from your left. The third angel's message. Do you see part one there? What is part one? Come on, talk. What is part one? Talk to me. What scriptures in part one? Chapter 14, verse 9 and verse 10. What's part two? Chapter 14 and verse 12 of the Revelation. All right. What year did our pioneers understand the second part, the Sabbath and the commandments? What year? The autumn of 1846. Here it is, my friends. Watch carefully. Let's confirm that. This is Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 75. From top, what it says together. In the autumn of what year? Come on, friends. We, we, we must know who we are. 
know our history, amen? amen? All right. In the autumn of 1846, we began to observe the Bible Sabbath. And what else? And to teach and defend it. Do you see it, my friends? So now, is the Sabbath the seal of God? So when did our pioneers begin to observe the Sabbath and to teach and defend the Sabbath, the seal of God? What year? The autumn of 1846. And then she said God gave her the vision in that year. Does it make sense? God showed her the heavenly sanctuary, the ark of God, the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, and also the Fourth Commandment, with a halo of light around that. Is that point clear, my friends? Amen. Now watch the point. Again, what's on your paper? What year did our pioneers begin to observe the Sabbath to teach and defend it? What year? The autumn of 1846. Two years after the autumn, October 22nd, 1844. Hold your place in chapter 18. Go to Amos. Chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Now we know this. What says Amos chapter 3 and verse number 7? Because prior to Ellen White keeping the Sabbath, teaching, defending it, in the autumn of 1846, there was a pioneer by the name of Joseph Bates. Was he a Sabbath keeper before 1846? However, it was not a test for God's people until God gave that truth to his inspired messenger. And that's what we're going to read now in Amos chapter 3. Read with me, verse number 7. What it says, my friends, surely the Lord God will do what, my friends, nothing. But he revealeth his secret unto whom? His servants, the prophets. So what year did God's inspired messenger, the prophetess, understood the Sabbath? And began to teach and also defend it. What year? Autumn of 1846. That's the second part of the third angel's message. Question, was the third complete yet? No. Not until 1847. What year, my friends? So put on your paper the understanding of the first part of the third angel's message came to our pioneers, came to Ellen White in the year 1847. What year did I say, my friends? Let's confirm that. Look at the screen. Volume 1, page 78. It says this from top. When we began to present the light on the Sabbath question, what year was that? Autumn of 1846. We had, watch carefully, we had no clearly defined idea of the third angel's message of Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through verse 12. So did they understand the mark of the beast crisis in the autumn of 1846? Let's read on. The burden of our testimony as we came before the people was that the great advent movement, the second great advent movement, was of God and the first and second messages had gone forth and the what now read with me and the third was to be given we saw that the third message closed with the words here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and we as clearly saw, as we now see, that these prophetic words suggested a what? A Sabbath reform. But, listen, but as to what the worship of the beast mentioned in the message was, or what the image and the mark of the beast were. Let's read now. We had no defined position. How many of you knew this? <laughs> so in the autumn of 1846, did they understand clearly 
the first part of the third angel's message. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, did they comprehend that? Yea or nay? No, my friends. But a change came in what year? Let's confirm it now. Early writings, page what now? 32. Listen what this says. From top, the Lord gave me the what now? The following view in what year? 1847. Watch carefully. I saw that what, my friends? Come on, talk to me. I saw that what? I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating ball between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. And that the Sabbath is the great question. And yet we have so many other doctrines, supposedly. Watch carefully. That the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's there waiting saints. Page 34. Let me skip this. Then she says, And when the never-ending blessing was pronounced on those who had honored God in keeping his Sabbath holy, what did she know now in 1847? There was a what now? A mighty shout of what? Victory. Over what? The beast. And what, my friends? And over his image. Whose is the mark? It's called the mark of the beast. All right. And who enforces the mark of the beast? The image. So when did she begin to understand now the worship of the beast, the image, and the reception of that mark? What year, my friends? Let's take a look now. In 1847, is everyone together, my friends? So now, what year did God now give our pioneers, the founders of God's remnant movement, the founders of Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventism. In what year did God give our pioneers the whole understanding of the third angel's message? What year, my friends? 1847. If that's clear, my friends, amen. amen. So from 1847, the third angel's message as a whole began to be proclaimed. All right, question now. What was about to be enforced? in the United States of America in the year 1888. It's on the screen right there. Far right of your screen. What is that event that was coming? Thank you, Jeff, for the chart. What is What was coming in 1888, my friends? This is the mark of the beast crisis. What year again, my friends? Now, get your writing instruments. Watch carefully. Get your paper. I want everyone to write down the year 1888 and subtract 1847 and tell me how many years you got there. How many years between 1847 and 1888 when God gave, watch carefully, the full understanding of the third angel's message, Earth's Final warning, how many years between 1847 and 1888? I'm waiting, how many years? How many years? It's 41 years, my friends. Oh, beloved, oh, beloved. Do you know what that means? How many years comprise a biblical generation? So when God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church and gave this church the full understanding of the third angel's message, after which Christ would come in verse 14 and verse 16. In one generation, biblical generation, Jesus wanted to return. Hold your place right there in chapter 18 and go with me to Psalm 95. Where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 95, in one generation, yet what year are we now living in? So what has taken us so long? Now, that will be part three, part four in this series. We'll talk about that. I'm just showing you how in depth, how deep this study is. And we need to understand why we are still here, my friends. 
And in this Bible study, I'll show you why we are still here. Look at the screen. Let's take a look here, my friends. This is Review and Herald, December 18th, 1888. This whole quotation says, in the year 1888, Congress was about to enforce a Sunday law. It's right there, my friends. It's right there. We have covered that before. And there it is. And there it is. Go to Psalm 95. Are you there in Psalm 95, my friends? Watch carefully. So when we talk about the coming Sunday law, we are talking about an issue, a crisis that could have taken place in 1888. But God's people were unprepared. So why has God delayed? Do you believe Christ wants to come, my friends? Look at Psalm 95. What does God's word say in verse number 9? What it says there, my friends? It says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my work, verse 10, how many years in verse 10? 40 years long was I grieved with this generation. And put beside verse number 10, Numbers chapter 32. Verse number 13, Numbers 32, verse 13, put down Hebrews chapter 3, verse 9, verse 10. The Bible tells us that one generation is 40 years based on scripture. Jesus wanted to come, my friends. Go back with me. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. So now, ever since 1847, Bible-believing Christians... Seventh-day Adventists have been proclaiming that the mark of the beast is coming. The Sunday law is about to be enforced ever since, ever since, ever since. That is the third angel's message. However, earth's final warning, the loud cry, the mighty cry, the loud voice, the strong voice will officially be proclaimed when the Sunday law is enforced. And this is what chapter 18 is all about. Look at this. Chapter 18, verse number 1, we read that. Verse number 2, we read that. Skip on down to verse 4. Are you there, my friends? Father in heaven, please, please, grant us more of your presence. For Christ's sake, amen. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying what my friends come out, come out of her my people that you be what not partakers of what two things that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive what not of her plagues question for you what event triggers the plagues what event brings the plagues what event causes God to pour out the seven last plagues upon unrepentant sinners? What is that event? Talk to me. It's the enforcing of the mark of the beast when Sunday is enforced as the law of the land and God's people are compelled to renounce and denounce the Sabbath and to keep Sunday or else they can't buy, they can't sell, they're convenience in life are stripped away from them many of them are going to be imprisoned and a few will be martyred this is when also Jesus comes and he pronounces a verdict upon every person's case based on our decision this is why we enforce the nearness of the mark of the beast crisis, my friends. This is where the dividing line is made in the sand. So my question is, are we to wait until the Sunday law, the mark of the beast, to preach the final warning to the world? Ah, oh, my friends, write this quotation down and book it. Volume 9, Testimonies. Page 20, we are told, are we to wait? Three questions. Three, are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? What value would our words be then? Are we to wait until the judgments of God fall upon the transgressor 
before we tell them how to avoid them? Where is your faith in the word of God? Must we wait until the prophecies come to pass before we believe what God has said? No, my friends, it is now. And Sister White had a vision. She saw a man standing in the vision and is pointing in every direction. And he says to her, the world is perishing. People are dying, going into Christless graves. People are partying, merrymaking, and dropping dead in these clubs. In accidents, they become deceased. People are getting angry and receiving a stroke and a heart attack. The world is perishing. The church is in apostasy. And Seventh-day Adventists are fast asleep. Look at this, evangelism. Page 32. Often we have been told that our cities are to hear the message. But how slow, from top, but how slow we are to do what, friends? Talk to me. To do what, my friends? All right. To heed the instruction. I saw one, and that one is capitalized. I saw one standing on a high platform with arms extended. He turned and pointed to in every direction saying, a world perishing, a world perishing in ignorance of God's holy law and seventh day Adventists are asleep. It's time to wake up my friends. The Lord is pleading, is he pleading? Who is he pleading for? For laborers, for there is a great work to be done, friends. And that's why one of our mottos, one of our themes for 2018 is that we must work with busy hands and one, an active brains. Oh, beloved. Back to the screen. It says, there are conversions to be made that will add to God's church such as shall be saved. Next two sentences, watch carefully. We are far behind in following the light God has given regarding the working of our large cities. Read words together. The time is coming when laws will be framed. I'm going to show you that in a few moments. When laws will be framed, that will close doors. Now open to what? The message, it says, my friends. We need to arouse to earnest effort. When? Tomorrow? Now. No, when the Sunday law is passed, right? You know, it says now, while the angels of God are waiting to give their wonderful aid to all who will labor to arouse the consciences of men and women, Watch carefully regarding what three things? Righteousness, temperance, and what? And judgment to come. Go to Acts 24 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Acts 24. So are we to wait until the mark of the beast to be aggressive with evangelism? Must we not know go forward in aggressive evangelism with busy hands and active brains? Is it not now, my friends? So must we all wait to accept Jesus and present truth until the mark of the beast is enforced? Must we wait until then to accept Jesus? Must we wait until then to receive present truth? What does 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 say? It says today is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. All right, my friends, today. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 7, verse number 8, God's word says it today, if you hear my word. And today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. It's time to surrender, my friends. Some of us, we sit here Sabbath after Sabbath. You're online, safe to serve, online, Sabbath after Sabbath, today. As Christ said on Calvary's cross, it is finished. Today we have to say to Satan and sin, it is finished. 
Acts 24, verse number, verse number 23, who called Paul to hear of the faith of Jesus Christ? It was Felix in verse 24. And what did Paul preach on? Did, look at the screen. Did Paul preach on those three last things on the screen? Last phrase. We must arouse the consciences on the screen of men and women regarding what, my friends? Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. What did Paul preach to Felix? He reasoned of righteousness temperance and judgment to come and what did Felix do how did he react he trembled my friends did he tremble to surrender what did he say next to Paul in response no 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 that's Agrippa that's Agrippa Felix when I have go thy way Paul go on now go on now Paul when I have a convenient season then I will call for thee. My friends, did the opportunity come to Felix then? Did he reject it, my friends? Yes, he did. And the question is, is there a biblical confirmation that Felix ever received another opportunity? His probation was closed, my friend. Likewise with King Agrippa. What did he say when Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come? Almost, Paul. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And the question is today, all of you who are local and you online, are you going to say like Felix? Go away now. I don't want to hear this right now. I want to enjoy the word some more. Hmm. I want to get married. I want to have a big home and flashy cars and high career. Is that what you're saying to Christ right now? Or are you saying like Felix and Agrippa, Agrippa, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. When must we surrender, my friend? Talk to me. When must we surrender? It is now. And I'm telling you, signs are happening all around us that show us the final Warning is due to earth's history. And Sister White says in Great Controversy, page 605, that when we see the agitation, the world is saying, it's time to enforce a Sunday law. The final warning is due to the world, my friends. Look at this. GC 605, from top here to four, those who presented, the what, my friends? The truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmist. Their prediction that religious, their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the U.S., that church and state would unite. That what, my friends? That church and state would unite to persecute those who keep God's commandments have been pronounced groundless. Absurd. But watch, it says, uh, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is what, my friends, is widely agitated. The event so long doubted, so long disbelieved, is seen to be approaching. Let's read the last sentence, last phrase. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before is there a call for a Sunday law going on my friend so what now is due to the world by God's grace I want to light a fire in your heart Amen. that like Jeremiah Jeremiah 20 and verse 9 ah uh, your words are like fire <laughs> shut up in my bones ah uh, I try to keep silent but I can't stop preaching this thing here. And the church of Laodicea, they are lukewarm. And Jesus says, I would that you were hot on fire, my friends. Are they calling for a Sunday law? I'm going to go through some things quickly you already know. And then I'm going to put this nail in a sure place by God's grace. Look at this. Slow Sunday. Climate change, we want Sunday. For the economy, we want Sunday. It, it's being called forward. Let me run through it. What is 
Poland calling for, friends? Poland limits a Sunday shopping ban. For what purpose? To benefit the family. Don't forget that. And then we saw in New Jersey, they're also strengthening the Sunday blue laws for the family, for worship. Watch this carefully. Let me run past this. In Poland, in Maryland, in North Dakota, and then we come to Iowa. February 12th, 2018. What is the headline there, my friends? And the headline is merely the tip of the iceberg. You watch when we get down to that paragraph. Headline says, keep car sales closed on Sundays. Why? For the family. Why? Because Sunday is the day of rest. And we want to preserve Sunday for the family. Is that not what Poland just did, my friends? A Sunday shopping ban? For what? Read that. For the family. Wake up, my friends. But that's Poland, right? No, it's in America now. There it is. In New Jersey, the same argument. Since I covered that before, it won't spend much time there. Move on. Here it is, my friends. This is the person, the author. I am a 20-year veteran of the new car sales business and who has worked in a state where Sunday sales were allowed. When I moved to Iowa, I was very pleased when I learned the state prohibited auto sales on what day? Talk to me. On Sunday. Then it says, I am speaking for all of us in the car business. In the car business. In the car business. When I say we dread working on Sundays, let's read red words, red words. Most of us are men and women who love our families and want to be with them as much as we can, especially on what day? So what are they saying for the, is the purpose to ban, to prohibit, to restrict car sales on Sunday? For what purpose? For the family. Do you see it, my friends? Oh boy, do you see it? Yes. All right. Next sentence. As far as the consumer, pardon me, not consumer, the customer goes. They will find a way to buy cars in the evenings or on Saturdays. That's key. Because we're not only going to be forced to keep Sunday, but we are going to be forced to desecrate the Sabbath. Last sentence. Then he says, now let's leave what? Let's leave Sunday as a day of rest for us. Great controversy. 605, when you see the question, being agitated. We want Sunday to be enforced. You can't buy. You can't sell. It's time for the final warning. I want God to put a fire in our hearts, my friends. Watch. And then, who is calling for this now? What is the headline there? Sundays. The Pope of Rome. Must be what, my friends? Must be a day of rest dedicated to whom? To God and the family. But based on scripture, what day is for the family? The seventh day Sabbath. On the sixth day of creation, who did God create? Adam and Eve. And what did he give them on the seventh day? Rest, my friends. So the Sabbath, seventh day, not Sunday, is the day for family, the day for worship. Do you see what the world needs, my friends? Watch carefully. Go to chapter 18 with me. Chapter 18, after Revelation, my friend, I want to share with you something. So they are calling for Sunday observance to be enacted as the law of the land. This is why I'm saying, young people, it's time to break up the foreground of your hearts. Young people, it's time to be serious for Jesus. Where are my young people? Se serious for God. It's now, my friends. It's now, not tomorrow, it's now God is calling you to be Bible workers. Yes, my friend, Bible workers, canvassers, literature evangelists, amen, call porters, amen, medical missionaries. He's calling you to be his servants in these last days. It's now. It's when, my friend? Now. I want to share with you, chapter 18, the Bible tells us the final warning descends in a time period 
when Babylon is committing fornication with the kings of the earth as well as with the merchants. What two groups? I'll wait on you. What two groups again? Now, could we just read this for emphasis? Go to verse 1. And I saw what now? Another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Verse 3. For all nations of what, my friends? Drunk of the wine, of the wrath, of her fornication, and the kings of the earth, and the merchants have waxed what? Pause right there. Kings and merchants. I'm going to share with you something here, friends. If, if Babylon the papacy is now uniting with the leaders of the world and the merchants of the world, when must that angel come down? When must verse 1 begin to take place? Look at this, my friends. Watch carefully. Look at this. This is February 12th, 2018. Anybody ever heard of Unilever? You, you have? It's a big monopoly. Guardian headline says, Marmite Maker. What, whatever Marmite is. Marmite Maker Unilever threatens to pull what, my friends, ads from Facebook and Google. For what purpose? Here it is. Don't miss it. The papacy is now working through the merchants to restrict liberty of speech and freedom of the press. Anybody who preaches, writes, and publishes anything that the papacy and her allies deem to be divisive, deem to be hate, hate speech, they must be dealt with, ostracized, marginalized. And the papacy is now working through the merchants. Watch this. Watch carefully. Unilever has threatened to withdraw its advertising from online platforms such as who? Facebook, Google. If they fail to eradicate content, which, do, which does what? Talk to me now. Which create division in society and promote what? Anger and hate. Question, what did Christ say in Matthew 10 verse 34? Think not. I am come to bring peace. But I've come to send what, my friends? To send what? What does a sword do? Does it bring separation? And the three angels' messages, it does bring division. It brings the wheat and get them ready for heaven, and the tears for damnation. So what will they label? Those who proclaim the three angels' messages. These folks are divisive. Do you see it, my friends? It's coming back to the screen. Watch carefully. It says, who is Unilever, by the way? Blue words, Unilever is the world's second biggest marketing spender. You may have never heard of Unilever, but as you can see, it's a monopoly over various brands, Vaseline and Bertali. And some of you have seen Bertali oil, olive oil in the grocery stores, right? It's a monopoly. Watch carefully. We want to weed out those so-called fake news and those who are spreading hate. I said, Lord, who is the CEO of Unilever? Paul, Paul Mann. Who is Paul Pullman? Another right-hand man of Pope Francis. Look at this. Watch this, my, May 29, 2015. What is the headline right there? Pope Francis. Francis. Who else? Business executives. Merchants? Merchants? You sure? Merchants? Number three. And government leaders do what now? Let's read chapter 18 again. Verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine, of the wrath, of her fornication, and who now? And the king's leaders have done what? And the merchants of the earth. Do you see the headline now, my friends? So what is now due to the world? The final warning, if that's clear, my friends, amen. 
And who is in that picture on May 29th? The World, World Resources Institute website. Who is on that picture? Whose name is in blue? Paul, Paul man. There he is with the arrow over his head. You can see it right there, my friends. That was May 29th. And what words did Paul Pullman say of the Pope in August 2015? Look at that. Welcoming the Pope to America. Do you see it? And who is telling Google and Facebook to ban hate speech? To ban extremist material. The Pope is saying that. So anyone who aligns with the Pope will echo the same sentiments. We are here, my friends. Watch. There it is. Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York. All right, past that. Here are his words. A message from Paul to the Pope. Listen to what he said. There are enduring values and a symbol of your papacy. Around the world, many of us have been inspired by your vision, Pope, and humbled by your commitment to a better world for all. You have become an emblem of our common humanity and a symbol of our hope for our common and yet increasingly fragile home. Let's read the red words now. We thank you for that, Mr. Pope, and we pray that others will listen to your teachings and follow your example. What says chapter 13 of the Revelation? And all the world, and all the world shall wonder, shall follow the beast. Are we here, my friends? Are you seeing this? And listen now, headline, independent. February 12, 2018, Facebook, did they bend over now? Did they compromise now? Did they yield now? Headline. Facebook pledges to meet advertiser demands after who spoke up? After who spoke up? After Unilever criticized them. Do you see who's behind this whole movement, my friends? Of restricting freedom of speech and the press? We are here. Hold your place in chapter 18. Look with me. Daniel chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, watch carefully. Chapter 3 of Daniel. I want God to put a fire in your heart. Look at the screen right here while you're going there. Did the Pope meet with uh, Apple's boss, Tim Cook? Did he also meet with Eric Schmidt, Mark Zuckerberg? And ever since that day, are they on a movement to restrict freedom of speech and the press? Any words that they deem to be divisive and bring division. Friends, we are here. Look at this right here. I'm going to give you the scripture now. Chapter 3 of Daniel. Are we there, my friends? Look at this. Headline, February 9th, 2018. Catholic News Agency. What is the headline there? Vatican. Conference unites police and church in fight against human trafficking. Does that ring a bell to you? Yes. Is that fulfilling prophecy to you? Amen. Would you say the police is a religious entity? No. A civil entity. So what two entities are now uniting? Church and state, my friends, on the various guises. Are you seeing this, my friends? Headline, unite police and church. What church is that? The Catholic Church. I want to ask you a question. Is the Catholic Church called the son of perdition? Yes. yes. Is the papacy called the son of perdition? Yes. Ah, my friends. Who in the Bible also is called the son of perdition? Judas. Besides Satan and the papacy, Judas in John 17 is called the son of perdition. Did Christ call Judas a thief? Did the thief, Judas, bring the officers, police, to capture Jesus? So now, in the Bible, did the police and thief unite? 
Read the headline now. Vatican Conference unites police and thief in fight against human trafficking. Do you see it now, my friends? All right. It says, uh, you can read that. Hold your place. Let's read this now. Daniel chapter 3. When Nebuchadnezzar was about to erect that image and to force people to bow down and to worship the golden image or be thrown in the fiery furnace. What groups of people did Nebuchadnezzar unite with himself? What groups did he unite with him? The princes of the world. Did Nebuchadnezzar also brought in the treasurers? Did he also bring in the office, the sheriffs? Who are sheriffs? Who are sheriffs? My friends, let's read that. Daniel chapter 3. Can we see what's coming next, my friends? That means the image is being formed. The next event, we are going to be forced to bow down. All right. And worship falsely or be persecuted. Go to verse number two. Then Nebuchadnezzar. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to do what now? To gather whom? Princes. Who else? Governors. And who else? Captains. And judges, who else? Who would those be in chapter 18? Merchants, treasurers, then what, my friends? The counselors, and who else? Who are sheriffs? So look at the screen now. Is he gathering in the sheriffs? All right, next slide. Who else does he have in his back pocket? Headline, who else? The business executives, the merchants, the treasurers. Who else? The government leaders. So what decree is about to be made very, very soon? Talk to me, my friend. What is about to be decreed very, very soon? Go, with, go back with me. Chapter 18. So that means we need an experience as those three Hebrews. If that's clear, my friend, say amen. amen. It's so close. Do I have the experience as those three Hebrews? If not, we are going to bow the knee. Do you think there are only three Hebrew boys in that day with Nebuchadnezzar? No. no, millions. But what did the millions do? Yeah. They bowed. I wonder why. <sighs> Must I go back to Daniel 1 and tell you why? Must I go back to Daniel 1 and tell you why they bowed? Hmm. We must get our diet under control. Yes. Must I go back to Daniel 2 and tell you why they bowed? Daniel and those three Hebrews, did they spend much time in prayer? Ah, yes. oh, my friends. And what did Christ tell the, the disciples in Gethsemane just before the thief, Judas, brought the officer, the sheriffs? Watch to watch and pray. What happened to those who were sleeping? Ah, oh, my friends. Do I have the Gethsemane experience? Oh, my, let me look at this. Watch carefully. Let's pass that off the screen. Look at this. This is Review and Herald, April 20, 1905. Watch what Sister White says. I'm going to show you something. What happened in South Florida? What happened in South Florida with that massacre? Think about what happened at the school in Parkland, Florida, while I read these words. And tell me if God is not saying, my people, it's time to be awakened. Get the Gethsemane experience before it's too late. And begin the final warning to the world. Start in your home, in the church, expand to the world. Look at this statement. There is no place in America of greater importance than Washington. So if there's anybody online right now from Washington, meaning Washington, D.C., I'm begging you. Get the experience. Let's begin the loud cry now. The recent developments in that place show that our brethren move there none too soon. Angels of heaven directed their course in planting the standard of truth in Washington. Men of influence are being aroused to study what, my friends? 
the truth for this time. Watch carefully. No opportunity should be left unimproved to establish the work firmly in this important place. God's angels will unite with the Lord's appointed ministers and whom? Medical missionaries. Praise God. Aiding them to exert on the minds of the people an influence in favor of what? Not only in Washington, D.C., next sentence, Philadelphia, and other important places should be worked. Why? Read on. Evangel Watch carefully now. Evangelists should be finding their way into all the places where the minds of men are agitated over the question of Sunday legislation and of the teaching of religion in the public schools. What are many high officials calling for to be brought back into schools since Columbine, Virginia Tech, and the list goes on. The one up there in the Northeast, Sandy Hook, and then now Parkland. And you have many folks saying, he's fake, they're fake, they're fake, his actors, fake. It doesn't matter if it's fake or real. These events are bringing about the fulfillment of prophecy. Let's unite church and state, my friends. All right. Again, red words. I want everybody to get this. Evangelist, should be doing what? Talk to me. All my friends. In all places where the minds of men are agitated over what? The question of Sunday legislation. Did we not cover that? They are calling for Sunday observance to be the law of the land. And what else? And of the teaching of religion. We're in the public schools. I'll come back to that. Then she says now, it is the neglect of Seventh-day Adventists to improve these providential opportunities to present the truth that burdens my heart and keeps me awake night after night. So my friend, if we can see now, they are calling for religion to be brought back in the public schools. What must we begin to do? What must we begin to work with? What must we begin to work with? Busy hands. And what, my friends, active brains. Look at it now, there it is, a nail in a short place. 17 dropped dead, they said at the school, move on, 18 school shootings in 45 days, and we know what happened. Here it is, what is the headline there? February 16th, 2018, USA Today. What's the headline there, my friend? It says, uh, removing religion from schools uh, contributed to the shootings. So how would you stop it then? Please, take this down, go back and read that article. You will see he actually said that. Look at this now. Dozens, put, what are they calling for? Put prayer back in the what, my friends? The schools. And of course, this man said, we must get God back into our, what did Sister White say? When they're calling, when they're agitating the Sunday law, and religion to be brought back into the school. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and all the other such places. It's time for God's evangelists, God's medical missionaries, to go forward aggressively in evangelism. Amen. Wake up, my friend. It's time, it's time. All right, all right. Watch carefully. And then it says, uh, Christian host. What is he saying here? School prayer would have prevented Florida school shooting. Now, the government runs the public school. So if you put religion back into it, what are we uniting? Church and state, my friends. And what about those who do not subscribe to that religion or that prayer? Persecution. It's coming, my friends. We are here. Here it is. A GOP candidate advocates what? Returning prayer to the classroom to stop school shootings. Are we here, my friends? All right. And then they said this man was demon-possessed. I wasn't there. Were you there? 
It doesn't matter. Fake or real, the issue is bringing about the last movement of earth history asunder law and this is what sister white says in volume 9 and page number 11 she says we may know when god's spirit is being withdrawn from the world volume 9 page 11 and then she says watch carefully she says men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Final movements will be rapid ones. Volume 9, page 11, my friends. And what's the headline right there on the screen? Florida gunman says what? Demon voices were speaking to him. Are we here? Are we here, my friends? And this is why I know it's time for us to receive the spirit of the loud cry. Just one sentence. Run past that. Do I have to all run past that too? Here it is, my friends. What are other blue words right there on the screen? Blue word says what? A work is to be done as we were there in California, in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, surrounding states, San Francisco, Oakland, the adjacent towns are to be worked. Let's read now. Oh, I see. So much the need of our ministers getting the spirit of the loud cry before it is too late. To work for the conversion of souls. Revelation chapter 18. Go back there with me, my friend. Are these things plain to us, my friends? Beloved, question, do you believe now it's time for this angel to descend? Yes. Do you not see it's time now this angel needs to descend with great power to lighten the earth with God's glory? Would you agree with me? It's now. Yes. All right. To understand what is coming, we have to look backward. And last week I told you that Christ experienced this. In Gethsemane, what came down to strengthen Jesus? Amen. Put the scripture down. Luke 22, verse 40 through verse 45. Did an angel come down to strengthen Jesus? Was Christ empowered? Two things. Was he empowered to drink the bitter cup? And what must all of us also drink? Must we not also drink that bitter cup? And the bitter cup is going to get even bitter. Yes, my friends. Yes. And that's why we must have now pep in our step with a song. It's now the angel came down and Christ was empowered. Did Christ lighten the earth with his glory? In John 18. Verse 4 through verse 6, when the men came to capture Jesus, and Jesus said to them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Christ said to them, I am he. What happened to them? They fell back as dead men. What happened there? The earth was lightened with God, the glory of divinity shone through Jesus and the men fell as dead men that experience we are going to manifest in these last days do you believe it Amen. yes but what was the 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 condition the prerequisite what what where was Christ before in Gethsemane what was he doing in Gethsemane so where must we find ourselves now so we can receive strength power to manifest God's character, God's glory. And this is the third angel's message in verity. This must be our experience. So while we emphasize, my sister, the coming son, the law, and we must emphasize and emphasize and emphasize, we must also emphasize simultaneously the coming angel to empower God's people, that they can lighten the earth with God's glory. What is God's glory? His character. Amen. 
And my friends, I'm going to tell you something. We have to hasten this angel coming down. Amen. Write this quotation down. Book it. Christ's object lessons. Christ's object lessons. Page 6 to 9, we are told Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in the church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. We must not only look for, but we must hasten his coming. And the only way to do this, we must find ourselves here in Gethsemane, the prayer closet. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. May I give you a golden nugget? Do you know it was a certain prayer that brought that powerful angel down? Yes. Let me come over here. It was a specific prayer that brought power to Jesus. It was a specific prayer that brought the angel down to strengthen Jesus. What was that prayer in Gethsemane? What did Christ pray in Gethsemane? Father, if it's willing, let this come pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will. But what? But thy will. Be done. And what came down the third time? The angel descended to empower Jesus. So verse 1 of chapter 18. What will bring this angel down? What prayer will bring him down? What prayer will bring him down when we say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. My friends, the songwriter says, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave. The God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let's make this practical. Not my will, but thy will be done. What were you severely tempted with yesterday? What were you severely tempted with last week? Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday. What were you severely tempted with? Think now, my friends. Let's get into Gethsemane right now. So if it was food, when once, you, once you're tempted with food and you know what God's word says about that particular dish, what must you say? Father, not my will. But what? But thy will be done. And your will says, I shouldn't eat this. Your will says, I shouldn't drink this. Your will says, I shouldn't smoke this. Your will says, I should not sniff this. Your will says, I should not put this in my vein. That's your will. How many times did Christ pray that prayer? Not my will, but thy will be done. So if you are, when you are tempted, don't stop praying it until you feel strong. And don't pray and keep looking at the thing. Pray and say, dear God, divert my attention. This is how you get victory. And for you individually, the angel will come down. So we are not just talking about an event for the whole church in the last days. And when I say whole church, I mean the whole saints, those who are sealed, the angel comes down. But on a personal, individual level, the angel can come down for me. He can come down for you. If it's dress, Lord, now my will. But thy will, and your will says take out the pants, etc. Not my will, but thy will. If it's music, are you seeing it now, my friend? 
and the angel will come down for you. If it's malice, if it's grudge, if it's unforgiveness, not my will, but thy will be done. And you keep praying it. It may not be three times for you, it may be ten times. But you keep praying it until you feel strong in the Lord. And then you can experience something. I'll tell you what it is. Volume 5, 120. Temptation once resisted. What did I just say? Temptation once resisted. Often gives power to more firmly resist a second time. Not my will, but thy will be done. In the same time period in Gethsemane, I'm going to come back to that. When the men came to capture Jesus, do you know there was a young man there having on a linen cloth? Put this scripture down. Mark 14, verse 50. Through verse 52, a young man with a linen cloth on. And when Judas brought church and state to capture Jesus, the men were about to capture that young man. And the young man who was once clothed in a linen cloth ran, leave the linen cloth and ran away naked. That's Mark 14, verse 52, verse 52. What is God saying to us? At the Sunday law crisis, many of us who profess now to have on the linen cloth, when the crisis comes, you'll run away naked, leaving the linen cloth. Hold on. What is the condition of lukewarm Laodiceans? They are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Naked. And what is the linen a symbol of that must cover our nakedness? Come on now. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have received the gospel today. In the closing scenes of Christ's earthly ministry, a man once had on a linen cloth, which typified righteousness. But when the crisis came, he ran away from the linen cloth and fled naked, my friends. And what is nakedness a symbol of based on Adam and Eve? It's a symbol of sin, my friend. A young man. Meaning, young in age, young people, this is for you. Go read it, Mark 14, verse 52, verse 53. A young man also, he typifies many who are young in the faith. They could have gone deeper and mature spiritually, but they remain stagnant spiritually. Young in the faith. Do I have on the garment? Do you have on the garment? And this garment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Is that point clear? What prayer did Christ pray again in Gethsemane? That brought strength down to meet the Christ. What was that prayer? Not my will, but what? But thy will be done. Was he strengthened for the crisis? And this is what God showed me. When you pray that prayer sincerely, you act it out. Lord, not my will. I got tithe money, but I got bills to pay. Not my will, but thy will be done. Show me a way out of this. You receive righteousness. What is righteousness? Right. Doing. 
this statement says. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is what, friends? United with his heart. What are those red words now? The will is merged in his will. What are the blue words now? This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. What did the young man run leave? What did the young man run leave? He ran leave the linen cloth, which typifies what? The righteousness of Christ. Watch now. What are we to do? Submit ourselves to Christ and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. This is what it means. To be clothed with the garment of Christ's righteousness. My friends, that means that young man, was he sleeping in Gethsemane or no? He was sleeping. Because he did not realize what Christ was praying. And that that prayer of Christ was to be his prayer. Not my will, but what? Thy will be done at that point when the crisis came, the temptation. He could have retained, keep on the linen cloth. Are you with me, my friends? Amen. So what must be our prayer in 2018? What must be our prayer every day in principle? Not my will. But thy will to be covered with Christ's righteousness. What must we do when tempted? Come on. What must we pray when tempted? Not my will. Everybody say it. Not my will, but thy will be done. And Christ will cover us with his righteousness. And that's why we're going to sing this song. Look upon Jesus. Sinless is he. Father impute. His life unto me. My life of scarlet. My sin and woe. Let's say it now. But cover with his life. Whiter than snow. Let's take that. Look upon Jesus. Sinless is he, Father imputes life unto me. My life of scarlet, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, my sin and woe, covered, covered with his life, wider. Take that second stanza. Second stanza. Transgression has made. Let's sing it out, my friend. Covered. Covered with his 
whiter, whiter than Let's get that third stanza. Third stanza. Longing the joy of to know. Pardon to know. Jesus holds out. Jesus holds out. A robe, out. a robe, a robe. Do you want it? Do you want it today? Lord, I Leaving my own. Leaving my Gladly own. I wear it. Gladly. Gladly I wear Let's sing it out. Cover with his life. My life my we don't want to be found naked. Let's sing it. Cover with yes. his life. Wider. Justified, oh yes, friends. Justified by life. His life, pure and clean. Sanctified, sing it. Sanctified by obeying His word. Will you today? And when He comes, glorified, glorified. glorified when Is He coming, friends? Is He near? Do you want to be covered? Let's sing it out. Cover with His life. Wider. Wider than snow. Yes. Fullness. Fullness of his Then shall I know. Life. Then shall I know. My life of scarlet. My life of scarlet. Today is salvation. My sin and woe. Cover. 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 my friend. Jesus says, Come now and let's reason. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be made as wool. Do you want this experience? If you be willing and obedient, if it's a condition, do you want to be covered, my friends? Will you submit and surrender everything to Jesus? Do you want the power to endure the bitter cup? The bitter trials in the marriage, in the home, in the life? Do you want that power to be God's messengers in these last days? Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want to be found naked? Do you want to discard the linen cloth? Or do you want to be covered? What must we say? Lord, not my will, but what, my friends? But thy will be done. And it's God's will for you to give him your heart right now. Do you feel the need for special prayer right now? If so, come to the front. Come to the front right now. If you feel the need for special prayer, come to the front right now. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. I don't want to be sleeping. I want to keep my eyes fixed on you. I don't want to be found running away from the linen cloth to be found naked in these last days. I want the true experience. Even those online, safe to serve online, do you want this experience? Do you want this experience? It's your choice, it's mine. Just choose and God will strengthen your choice. Not my will, but what, friends? Thy, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Kneel with me at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. Look upon Jesus. Sinless is he. Father, impute your life unto us. My sin of scarlet, my sin of woe, 
But today we want to be covered with your life and to be pronounced in the judgment whiter than snow. Whenever we are tempted, help us to remember the prayer in Gethsemane that Christ prayed, not my will, but thy will be done, and he was strengthened. This is a secret of victory for us. And nobody falls into sin ignorantly. If we look back at each temptation, we saw the fork, the fork in the road. We can either go left in sin or go right in right doing. At each intersection, we must say when tempted, Lord, prone to wonder, I feel it. But not my will, thy will be done. Asking you to divert our minds, and you will, for your word says in Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Safe to serve local in this church. And those of you online, remember that will that you must surrender, you don't even have the strength to give up that will. It is God, the Bible says, Philippians 2.13, that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To will a desire. To do action. Only God can give us that desire. And the power to do what is right. And this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of Christ's righteousness. Righteousness by faith. The third angel's message in verity. The second part. And the coming mark of the beast crisis. The close of probation. The first part. Thank you for what you gave us today, dear God. Now we have to leave this church and go into our laboratories. Life, life in general. Go back home, life in, this is a laboratory. And we now have to test the theory. We have to work on the promise, the theory of the word and see if it works. But we can look to Gethsemane, see Christ and see it works. It works. It works. So if we try the formula and it doesn't work one time, keep looking at Christ in Gethsemane and keep working, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. And by working consistently, persistently, then you will bring it to fruition. We want to be covered with right doing, your righteousness. Every knee that is bowed, Accept every person who today say, Lord, I want Bible studies. I want to be baptized. Is there one today? Just raise your hand. Put your hands down. Who said, Lord, I want Bible studies. I want, I want to be baptized. Is there one? Raise your hand for Jesus. Is there one? Is there another? You say, Lord, I want this experience. I see you. I see you, sis. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Father, hands down, accept our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord and save us, we pray. Bless every decision and seal the decisions until you bring the decisions to fruition. We love you, dear God. We love you. So much mercy. My life of scarlet. My sin and woe. What a beautiful message. We can be covered with his life. And when the Father looks at us, he will not see our wretchedness, but see the life of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord. This is the gospel. Save us, we pray. And teach us daily to say like Paul, I die daily. It's our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.